Hi, this is Frank, and welcome back to The Next Realignment. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the heyday of the second party system, the Democrats and the Whigs, and the events leading up to the second party system's decline. For about the two decades after the election of Andrew Jackson in 1828, the second party system was at its height. America now had two new parties, the Democrats and the Whigs, and they were engaged in a new great ideological debate over this new set of problems that America had to deal with and resolve. And that was the problems of this new changed America of the frontier. The American people demanded to figure out how to take this elite driven republic and to turn it into more of a democracy. And that debate on how to accomplish that and how to do it while keeping all the growth and the entrepreneurial spirit and the pioneering that was part of the American character, that is what defined this new second party system. The Democratic Party, it drew from from farmers and workers and laborers and a lot of times immigrants, many of them Catholic, from places like Ireland and Southern Germany. And then this Whig Party, It drew from the new middle classes, from professionals, from doctors and shopkeepers and lawyers and the commercial elites and bankers and the plantation elite. The way that they divided America, it was something new. It wasn't the way that we had done it before with the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. It divided America differently. It cared about different issues and ideas. And it was also, it's different from our modern conservatism and liberalism because neither the Whigs nor the Democrats, they weren't reliably conservative or liberal as we think about them today. The Whigs, you know, sometimes they get called conservative because they were considered a pro-business party. But they were also a party of social and moral reform. They were a party of big government and tariffs. And then you look at the Democratic Party, and sometimes people want to call them liberal because they were a populist party for workers. But at the same time, Right. They hated business. They wanted small government. They, uh, they didn't agree with uh, social and moral reform being driven by the government. Neither of these parties were reliably conservative or liberal the way that we think about them today. These parties, too, they weren't just having a debate among the political class. It was a true national debate. And what I mean by that is this. See, the first party systems parties, they were, they were odd in the sense that America's founding generation hated political parties. They didn't want to create them. Once they did, they felt guilty about it. They kept trying to get away from them, that they saw them as a mistake and corruption. But in the second party system, this new generation, they felt very differently. See, they loved political parties. They thought they were great. And they went about on purpose to build national machines to actually mobilize people, to get them involved, to bring them into the political system, and to actually mobilize them to get things done and to drive their agenda forth. Both parties did this, but nobody more than the Democrats, because the Democrats had Martin Van Buren. See, Andrew Jackson, one of his closest advisors, was Van Buren. Eventually, later on in his second term, Van Buren would become his vice president. And Van Buren had a unique role in he was kind of made himself the chief party strategist. It took it upon himself and thinking parties were a good thing that he was going to build a machine, a machine that could mobilize people and drive his agenda forward and get things done. And to take this Jacksonian movement and these ideas and this coalition of people and to turn them into an actual organization and an organization that reached and touched across America. Now, the Whigs weren't as good at it, but they still, seeing what the Democrats did, tried to copy and do it the same. They were kind of better sometimes in the media and working through newspapers. They were less organized, but they still, they too tried to build a national organization. So for the first time in America, politics became, in fact, something of an entertainment and a sport. That... As the American people came into this new party debate, they threw themselves into politics as 
not just a way to drive change in government, but identity and entertainment and fun. When you looked at the founding generation, politics, you had these dueling pamphlets and making arguments. But now in the second party system, you had things like you got the brass bands, you got the parades, you get the, the speeches on platforms with red, white, and blue bunting. And you get speeches that are meant not just as political arguments, but as, as a type of entertainment. And that was particularly true as you went into the frontier. Because in these frontier communities, you'd get these small towns surrounded by family farms. And there wasn't a lot of entertainment. So what entertainment they did have is they had politics. Adding to that, you also now had the spoils system. Right. As the Democrats had developed this idea that there was nothing that any ordinary person couldn't do in government and that they were going to make their appointments based on whether people supported them in the party. And it meant if you worked on campaigns, if you helped get people elected, maybe that meant at the end you could get a job. Maybe you'd be the new inspector of ports or you could run the new post office and be the postmaster of your area. Now, not only was entertainment was politics entertainment. It was potentially a source of a job. And while the Whigs originally were wary of this, eventually they came around too, and they started adopting some of the same methods. So you saw sky-high voting, sky-high participation, and mass politics on a completely national scale. As this debate went on, these two parties, they, they, they jostled for control back and forth. They both kind of competed for government. You had Jackson had his two terms, and then Martin Van Buren, who had been his vice president, he served a term until he lost. He lost the White House to the Whigs under William Henry Harrison. William Henry Harrison was a military leader and a general. He'd been a military hero in the Battle of Tippecanoe against the Native Americans. And then he became the first Whig president. Unfortunately for him, he died a little over a month into his first term. He handed the office over to John Tyler, who was his vice president and was a party switching Democrat who was added on the ticket to try to pick off some Democrat votes, which created a mess for the country because Tyler decided he was going to thwart a lot of the Whig agenda and started vetoing bills. And he ended up to being a man without a party hated by both the Whigs who he had abandoned and the Democrats, the party that he'd left. And that took us to the election of 1844. Here's the thing. Once America got into the 1840s, you could see that there were some things underneath that were changing and the party system that had been so vibrant was now starting to decay. Now on the surface, it still looked great. People were enthused. They were energized by politics. They were energized by this debate and the two parties were still making the same arguments and pushing forth the same ideas. But underneath, some things had started to change. The first was the issues of the Jacksonian democracy had been mostly quietly resolved. Jackson wanted to add the people, bring them to the center of government. Well, now they were. Politics was a popular enterprise. Everybody was interested in politics and government and they were getting jobs in government. This was no longer an elite republic. This was the democracy that Jackson had always wanted it to be. The Democrats wanted to push the country west and clear land for settlers, even pushing Native Americans off their land as an expense. Well, it had happened. People continued moving west. The Whigs, they wanted their American system, economic program, right? They wanted tariffs to protect manufacturing. Well, manufacturing was starting to, to bloom and, and mature. There was less need for the tariffs. And the infrastructure, well, whatever the Democrats said, they were now quietly mostly on board. The country had been building all the roads and the canals and the railroads. And more than that, now, a lot of that was getting done by private investors anyway. There was really no need for government investment in the first place. So while on the surface, these parties were still fighting over these Jacksonian issues, it was sort of the same situation at the end of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. In substance, there was no longer so much to really be fighting about. Beyond that, there was another major change that turns out to be very important. By the 1840s, there was now a religious revival ripping across the country, the Second Great Awakening. It's probably the biggest, most powerful religious revival ever to hit the country. People started refilling the churches and a new brand of evangelical religion swept across the country. There were now these 
itinerant preachers. They were going from small town to town. They were having tent revival meetings. And in these meetings, they would spread religion along with entertainment and politics. And all the people in these towns would come because it gave them something to do. And it changed their perspective on the world. What these preachers are preaching is a different form of religion. It's evangelical, but more than that, it's millennial. They're preaching that it's man's duty to create God's kingdom on earth. And if ye did, as soon as they created God's kingdom on earth, that will bring about the second coming. And therefore, if people could make America a just and moral country into a mirror of God's kingdom on earth, that would trigger the second coming. And that it was their duty as Christians to do just that. That naturally spawned a lot of really powerful social movements, many of which had a huge impact on the next era of America history. It created things like temperance. It created the beginnings of women's suffrage. But most powerfully, it created a new movement for the abolition of slavery. The prior generation had thought slavery was something they wanted to push down the agenda. Now there was an energized group of activists that wanted to push it to the top of agenda. And they didn't want to wake. It was an issue of good or evil, and it had to be resolved. Because if it wasn't resolved, you couldn't turn America into God's kingdom. And if you couldn't do that, you were preventing the second coming. So now it's 1844. Henry Clay is now going to run for president again. And this is finally his opportunity to win and to vindicate himself after years of lusting after the office. He thinks this is his opportunity to get the Whig agenda finally pushed through in the White House and undo the mess that Tyler had done. And he thinks he's going to be running against Martin Van Buren, the former president who's now going to run again to get his office back. But on the way out the door, John Tyler made one more mess. Because what he did was he decided that he announced he was going to allow for the annexation of the Republic of Texas. Completely messed up the election. Because Texas at this point was an independent republic. It had seceded and won its independence from Mexico. And ever since, it had been trying to join the United States as a state. But the U.S. government was very wary of admitting Texas for a couple of reasons. Among them, that it would be admitting one new huge slave state, which was going to change the balance of the issue, which made people nervous. But more than that, there was a good chance that annexing Texas would create a dispute with Mexico, particularly over the border, and very well lead to war. It destroyed Van Buren's campaign because Van Buren, being seeing it as a terrible idea, refused to endorse it, made himself unpopular with a lot of Democrats, basically lost the opportunity to win his nomination. And the party nominated instead somebody few, that a lot of Americans had never even heard of, the Speaker of the House, James K. Polk. The Whigs thought that they had just lucked out. They had a new slogan mocking the Democrats. Who is James K. Polk? Polk turned out to be a lot more savvy than anybody thought because he not only endorsed the annexation of Texas, he took it two steps further. He also said that he was going to aggressively renegotiate the border in the Pacific Northwest with Great Britain, the old 54-40 or fight. And beyond that, that the United States, he claimed, had a destiny to reach all the way to the Pacific Ocean and conquer the rest of the continent all the way as far as it could go. The idea that we came to be called Manifest Destiny. The idea was wildly popular, and it put Polk in the White House. So it turned out for the Whigs, and the answer to their taunt, was, their, or their taunt was, who is James K. Polk? He's the next president of the United States. And in his term, he so shook up politics that he sent the second party system, which was already quietly rotting away, into terminal decline, leading to the collapse of the Whigs and ultimately setting the stage for a civil war. Thanks a lot for watching, and make sure you tune into the next episode, because we're going to be talking about how the Whig party imploded, taking down the second party system, throwing America into years of political chaos, and all eventually ending in a civil war. Thank <laughs> you.